Welcome to Sketchy. We take all the super complex stuff you need to learn and turn them into memorable visual stories packed full of everything you need to know on test day. Click the link in the corner or description to try for free for seven days. Now let's get to it. Ah, <sighs> the skull. The bony exterior housing what's arguably the most important three-ish pounds in your body. As you might imagine, within a closed space like the skull, there's not a lot of extra room. So when the contents inside the skull expand, everything quickly becomes much more, well, cramped, increasing the pressure on the contents inside. High pressure, wait, that's hypertension. Intracranial hypertension isn't caused by increased blood pressure, however. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. Increased pressure of the contents of the skull, including brain tissue and cerebrospinal fluid, will actually impede proper blood flow to the brain. Not good. In this sketch, we'll talk about a few of the most common causes of increased intracranial pressure, their clinical manifestations, and some of the more squishy complications of severely elevated pressures inside the skull. Let's go back in time to the 1870s, when hot air balloons were a viable mode of transportation and mustaches were prerequisites for entrance into the ranks of gentlemen, so much so that even the balloons themselves sported them. We're meeting these hyperinflated head balloons somewhere over the Indian Ocean, embroiled in a not-so-gentlemanly race to be the first to circumnavigate the globe by balloon. The cranial vault contains three things, brain, blood, and CSF. Normally, all three components fit snugly, but comfortably inside, hugging each other like friends do. Normally, the pressure within the skull, i.e. intracranial pressure, stays below 15 millimeters of mercury. However, when things go awry, the ICP rises above 20 millimeters of mercury. We call the resulting condition intracranial hypertension. See the rope supporting that gentlemanly hot air balloon? Notice that they depict greater than 20 in Roman numerals. Remember, intracranial hypertension is not blood hypertension. All this pressure is actually decreasing perfusion to the brain. Cerebral perfusion pressure, i.e. how well the brain is receiving blood, is determined by subtracting the intracranial pressure from the mean arterial blood pressure. So, blood pressure forces blood into the brain, while intracranial pressure squishes it back out. If ICP is too high, it can impair blood flow to the brain and cause brain ischemia. When CPP gets down to zero, well, no blood to the brain pretty quickly results in brain death. But before we get into the clinical manifestations of intracranial hypertension, let's talk about what causes elevated intracranial pressure in the first place. If the skull contains brain, blood, and CSF, then it stands to reason that too much of any of these components can jack up the ICP. Let's start with CSF, the fluid that lives in the subarachnoid space surrounding the brain and spinal cord. It's produced by the ventricles of the brain and drains back into the venous system via arachnoid granulations. Any pathology that messes with this system can cause an increase in volume of CSF in the ventricular system, causing them to enlarge. This is termed hydrocephalus. Obstruction of CSF outflow from the ventricles causes what's called non-communicating hydrocephalus, and decreased drainage of CSF causes communicating hydrocephalus. We'll get all into hydrocephalus's business in our next sketch, so don't worry about the details for now. 